Hey everybody, welcome back to the second episode of the Weird Bible Podcast with uh, yours truly. I'm Aiden Mattis, and this is the uh, extraordinary Wendigoon, um, Isaiah. He's, you know, over doing his thing. Uh, I, I see you've got a, a, a new plaque on your wall. <laughs> that's, to, uh, that's to celebrate one million, right? That that'll be the day that what you that you just cancel YouTube. <laughs> it's the day you, it's the day you cancel yourself. You're like I'm out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, you love to see it. Oh, they're saying you're muted. Uh, for the love of God, you're not on my end. So I'm I'm seeing you. That's the thing is I'm I'm getting your audio. And I just turned you back on. Um, hang on, let's see. Uh, that, that's the thing. It's uh, like I'm my audio. Where's my audio output capture? Oh, maybe that's why. Did you have me? Um, did you not have audio output capture? That's cute. Uh, it looks like someone, Aiden, turned off uh, the microphone. Um, can you guys hear him now? I guess we'll just sit here and wait Hi. For them yes. To, uh... Hello. I'm speaking. We'll see if they uh, oh, I can, uh... acknowledge me or if they can hear me. I can also just pull it up and see. That's what I'm doing. Yeah, I can hear me. I can hear me on the thing. Yeah, we're oh, good. Okay. Cool. Cool. Hey. There we go. Yeah. I don't um... know what they're talking about. <laughs> would, it, would, would it be an episode of anything on the Lore Lodge channel if there weren't technical difficulties? Uh... <laughs> It'd be funny if they were just messing with you. Uh, like yeah, fun, one of these days fun. they're going to. But uh, you know, to, to recap, what we said was uh, you have a nice shiny gold plaque behind you. I do. It's big, uh, it's heavy, and I said that one day it's going to fall and break everything over here. And when it does, I'm just going to leave it like that. Well, so Would you Would happen. you perhaps describe it as, uh, as giant? <laughs> oh boy, would I? <laughs> <laughs> Had to get us there. All right. So, <laughs> so uh, in in you know in light of World War Three, uh, I figured this would be a good topic to talk about. We actually did plan this a couple weeks ago. I texted Isaiah and I was like, "Hey, you want to talk about hell?" <laughs> I was like, "Yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> well, let's do that it. Let's go. <laughs> Might as well." So, uh, so what? What I did, I, I don't know how you prepped for this, uh, but what I did was I went through and uh, read the Bible a bunch of times, um, some specific chapters, <laughs> oh, and uh, and I, I was reading through it, and one of the one of the most common um, things you hear when it comes to uh, the descriptions of hell, one of the most common criticisms of Christianity is, you know, how could a loving God uh, throw anybody who doesn't sit down and worship him into uh, this lake of fire for all of eternity for punishment and it's a good question uh that is that is a phenomenal question and it's something that very often what i see from um tiktokers youtubers uh even some apologists is like oh well that's just you know that's that's what you get for admonishing god or turning away from god um and i didn't totally like that for a number of reasons one of them was that doesn't, in my opinion, fit the Old Testament God. And I don't think that the God who created the universe and time and humanity and everything that we have experienced as human beings for the, the time we have been on Earth, I don't think that he would randomly change his mind and decide, you know what, I, I feel like maybe everybody should burn in a lake of fire forever after they die um, instead of just going into kind of a non-existence were an empty void like the the Old Testament God. So uh, what I did was I went through, and there are in the NKJV, uh, as well as, th this varies a little bit depending on which version you use, but in the NKJV, the New King James Version, there are 12 specific uses of the word hell. Most of them are by Christ himself. Uh, in fact, I think all of them are by Christ himself where he's but but a lot of them are in parables a few of them are not but most of them are in parables 
And what's interesting is if you look at the King James Version of the Bible, uh, or the American Standard Version of the Bible, or the English Standard Version of the Bible, or the New International Version of the Bible, the word that gets used every single time is hell. And in a lot of these, it says the fires of hell uh, into the, the lake of fire or something like that. And hell and lake actually get changed out a few times, depending on which translation you're using, which I think is interesting, because the word that's actually used is Gehenna. And for those who don't know, Gehenna is not a abstract concept like Sheol or Tartarus. Uh, Gehenna is a physical place right outside of Jerusalem. And it's to the southwest of Jerusalem, and it was a is a valley that to this day, I believe, actually remains uninhabited. Um... You know, but it's it's a valley outside of Jerusalem where the Canaanites, prior to the the Israelites claiming the region, and even afterwards, people who were idolaters um, in in the Jewish tradition, uh, would go and they would sacrifice children to uh, their gods. Now, the term that is even used in Encyclopedia Britannica, and I think this is very interesting, uh, the term that gets used is uh, moloch. And they say, this is where they sacrificed the children to Moloch, which does not fit with the modern scholarship, which suggests that the, the Moloch is not a deity himself, but rather a verb meaning to sacrifice, uh, you know, or a specific method of sacrifice, that being um, placing a child onto a funeral pyre. Um, so, <laughs> in light of that which actually fits very well with the way that the Phoenicians and the Canaanites worshipped their chief god Baal and his uh, consort Tenet, that actually makes complete sense. And then when you go and you look at it, all of these, uh, th the way that they kind of got rid of that was they did a couple of things. A, they made it illegal. And B, they took Gehenna, this valley outside of Jerusalem, and they essentially turned it into a landfill where they would go and they would put trash and waste and they would burn all of it. Um, and so you quite literally would have the fires of Gehenna a it was a fiery pit outside of Jerusalem um and of the 12 times the word hell is in the New Testament 11 of them are Gehenna one is Tartarus and that one is in second Peter um so to that's uh that's the background I think to, to give everybody and uh from there we can we can start to talk about the actual theology behind hell and and punishment and what God and Jesus actually say in the Bible about all of all of this and what the afterlife is. Because there's actually, if I remember correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, Isaiah, I think there's more mentions of hell than there are of heaven. Like, more description of hell than there is of heaven. Yes, there is. Yeah. And, uh, the, only, the only real descriptions of heaven, again, mentioned outside of, like, a couple passing phrases from Jesus, is in Revelations, during John's uh, visions that he has. Other than that, it's all about hell. Heaven mm -hmm. is rarely mentioned. Which I find super interesting. Um, mm -hmm. But I guess, like, it, it does make sense to warn people about the bad thing more than get them excited about the good thing. Um, you know, one of those is kind of more pertinent. Like, the, the good place, you want to go to the good place. You, you The bad place, yeah. you should be warned about why you don't want to go there. Right. Which is why I think some of it, uh, and we'll get into more details as we talk about the specifics, but I think some of the language around hell is for that purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, because it is a good, like, obje objectively, depending if you think the Bible's interpretation of it's very literal or not or whatever, it is probably a good idea to be afraid of it <laughs> and to not want that to happen. Yeah, and even if you're looking at hell as this, uh, you know, more of an abstract concept, and rather than a lake of fire, it's eternal separation from God. Um, that's, that's not a good thing. That's not the kind of thing that you're looking at and you're being like, yeah, I can tolerate that. No, that's not fun. You don't want that. <laughs> like, theologically, that's, because the entire book is essentially, that which is good is to be close to God. That which is not good is to be far from God. Um, so generally, you would you would then be able to extrapolate that to mean that you're going to feel good when you're close to God, and you're going to feel bad when you're far from God. And if the afterlife is essentially just like a a extrapolation of that concept, then being far from God, even if it's not in a literal lake of fire, is not what you want. It's not a good thing. Yeah, um, yeah. And it's I think um, to a degree I don't necessarily consider it misinformation, so to speak, but I do 
think to a degree it was effective instead of just being like, oh, it's the absence of creation. Like, what does someone know about that? Instead of being like, yeah, it's like fire and <laughs> everything's on fire and it hurts. Don't do it. <laughs> and that's enough, that's such an important point when you look at the history of Christian theology and how all of this developed. You know, even even Christ himself in the New Testament, when he's speaking to the masses, he doesn't go out there and give them specific explicit details. He gives them parables. He says, in, instead of going and saying explicitly, uh, if someone leaves the congregation and goes and, you know, leaves the faith and apostates and everything, and, you know, when they come back, accept them. No, he gives you the parable of the prodigal son. So it's... It, yep. And, and I think there's a lot of people who look at the Bible and they read it and they, they don't have that um, that background, that understanding to understand that what you're looking at is not Christ being literal at all times. He speaks in metaphor. He speaks in allegory all the time. Tolkien would have absolutely hated him. Um, <laughs> Tolkien may have been a very, very like staunch Catholic, but I don't think he and Christ would have gotten along in terms of literary uh, chops. Uh, <laughs> I don't think Tolkien would have liked Jesus. <laughs> that's that's your take of the day. That's yeah, you know. Hey, it's we got to have some hot takes on the show. Like, you know, what are you gonna get? But yeah, so I mean, when I'm curious, you're a Sunday school teacher. You know, how do you teach mm -hmm. about hell when it comes up? Because I, that's got to be a question that gets asked. Yeah, so it comes up a lot. Uh, for those that don't know, my Sunday school class also isn't your stereotypical like. You know, elementary school, preschool, it's like a high school and college age class. So questions about things like that, about eternity, are pretty common outside of just, you know, what happens to us when we die. Um, the way I normally teach it is with everything I do, I try to, well, I keep everything grounded in the Bible uh, to keep it direct. And I really emphasize the thing like it is eternal separation from God. Um, I... The big, like this is more of a personal opinion than it is a biblical one. I think the biggest difference between life on earth and the afterlife is that the afterlife is a completely new form of existence that we can't really comprehend in a lot of ways. Um, Christ talked about how can man know, you know, the mind of God or how can he know the omnipotence and all that. The best example I've heard it described is is if someone was born blind, how would you explain to them what things look like or what color was or something like that? If, if they don't have the knowledge of it, it's kind of hard to lay that out. And I think a lot of uh, the messages in the Bible are done in that way. It is Jesus um, or God speaking through man of this eternal wisdom and knowledge of existence trying to talk to us who has a very finite perception of reality about what the afterlife is and everything else so that being said if it is not which i i do agree that i don't think it is god flicking sinners into hell for all eternity that's a very like past couple century evangelical mindset of how the afterlife works and all that um i do think that with a lot of the stuff jesus said it is the closest he could describe it that we could understand in my opinion um so but so like maybe not you know like you said 100 percent literal of everything but i also don't necessarily think he was using trickery or trying to like get people to lean their heads one way when it's actually the other again it's explaining to something that has no concept of what the reality of the situation is and just being like yeah it's like fire yeah, you get that. You know what a fire is. <laughs> and I think that's that's a really salient point about the entire Bible too, because there are a lot of points where, when something is being described to human beings, it very often takes the form of symbolism or allegory. Even when it is meant to be taken pretty literally, it's it's being described in a way people can understand. Uh, one of my favorite examples is um, the the book of Genesis, the very beginning of it. You've got, uh, on the first day, God creates light. Mm -hmm. on, and then, you know, you, you go on for the next six days of creation. But one thing that stuck out to me about that is the fact that um, you get the end of the first day before the earth and the sun are put in place. Um, so how can you possibly describe something as a day when 
there are no days yet. And I think the reasoning behind that wording in the Bible is that what he's doing is he's not necessarily separating time into specific 24 hour days of creation, but rather it's separating time into six blocks. And then on the seventh day, God rests. Um, and I don't know how, how do you feel about that? I think, um, with a lot of that, like with the days of creation, I guess I'm kind of a middle of the road approach because God, God is omnipotent, correct? Like he is mm -hmm. an all powerful, he, he can do whatever he wants, right? If he wanted to snap and everything exists, then by our understanding, everything should exist in a moment, in an instant. Um, that being said, I am very thankful that the way God decided to create the world is through means of science and like matter and mm -hmm. physics that we can comprehend. Because could you imagine if everything was like outside of our realm of view, <laughs> like if like something, like something exploded or stuff and we didn't know how matter works or anything. We're like, Oh, let's hope that doesn't happen again. <laughs> like that would be terrifying if things happened and we had no, feasibility with it yeah and, um, and when you look at the old testament like a lot of the time things do happen that you don't you don't like that they definitely didn't have an understanding of like we right. might be able yes, to go exactly. and, we might be able to go look back and be like oh okay like that's how that can happen. <laughs> but at the time right. you know I, I just i just imagine the destruction of sodom and gomorrah and just people being like what the was that <laughs> 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 sun coming out at 9 p.m you know fortunate sun playing in the distance like <laughs> <laughs> the sun coming out at 9 p.m oh no <laughs> <laughs> that's but that's what i think about i'm like because stories like that like i uh, also you know um the walls of jericho you know march around the city for what is it six or seven days seven, seven days march around the city for seven days blowing your horns and then the walls just fall like I, I, honestly, that one still perplexes me. I'm gonna be honest. Um, I'm, I'm wondering what the science there is. Oh, I think with a lot of it, something else to realize is whenever, before we were in the age of faith and grace that we're currently in now, before Jesus died and all that, um, things on Earth that had to do with the spiritual were much, much more physical. And the reason for that was the Holy Spirit had not yet left the presence of God. Mm -hmm. So God had to physically interact with things on earth like one of the best examples of like you know how spiritualism was so common is whenever uh moses went to um the pharaoh and said let my people go and he threw his staff on the ground and it became a serpent mm -hmm. like that's crazy right like that's a miracle of staff becoming a serpent but then the pharaoh's magicians came forward and they threw their staffs on the ground and they also became serpents <laughs> And the symbol, and the thing that happened there was Moses's ate the two other stakes, yeah. symbolizing our God is greater than your God. However, that was still an act of sorcery that they were able to turn their staffs into serpents. Mm -hmm. And I think either through like, as familiar as I am about concepts of lesser gods mm -hmm. or the demons that are mentioned in the Old Testament, I think supernatural occurrences were much more common that even by today's standards, they would be seen as supernatural. Yeah. They are like outside of our realm of understanding. And I think that after God, the, the physical presence of the law left earth and the mm -hmm. Holy Spirit dwelt in us, that that subsided um, at least to like a visual physical degree. But I think a lot of the stuff in the Old Testament, like Jericho, was miraculous mm -hmm. all around. Uh, because there's so many stories in the Old Testament. Like to take... Um, Ezekiel, for example, mm -hmm. like not only the visions that he had, but after that, those same cherubim appeared and slaughtered a battlefield. Mm -hmm. Like, there's no physical, <laughs> there's no science explanation no, for exactly. whatever that was. <laughs> and uh, I do think this is a good point to uh, to kind of pause and, and maybe explain some Christian theology to the people who uh, are less familiar, or even I know we have viewers who are agnostic or atheist and are tuning in kind of for. For the, for the understanding where the Christian side is coming from. Um, but uh, the, the Trinity is definitely one of those concepts that a lot of people struggle to grasp, and I can understand why, because how can one God have three aspects and not be three different gods? Like, yeah, how does that work? Um, if you want the Trinity on steroids, go look into uh, Hindu um, theology, because uh, all of their millions of gods are one God, uh, the the force, essentially, the, the Brahma. Um, 
So, it, do, mm, I, I cannot. T- I was sitting in my world religions class in college, and I, somebody was like, the professor is describing Hindu religion. And he's like, yeah. So all the gods are aspects of this one force called the the Brahma, and I was like, the force. And I'm thinking he's the way he's, the way he's describing it. He's like, yeah, it just kind of like flows through you and and around you. It envelops you. And I'm like, this. I am getting taught lessons by Obi Wan Kenobi right now. Um, by the way, I, I'm I'm almost you positive. All drama the force. <laughs> that's the word that was used to describe it to me. Um, but you know, it's 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 such an interesting uh, you know, concept. But uh, you know, with the Trinity. The, you've got the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, the Father, of course, being God, the, the Creator. The Son being Jesus Christ, the uh, the God as man, God and man in one, because Christ is both man and God. Um, and then you've got the Holy Spirit, who is the Force. Um, <laughs> but uh, if you want to, if you want to explain like the the more in depth theology behind specifically, I think the Holy Spirit, because I think people get a grasp of who. God and Jesus are. I think the Holy Spirit is kind of nebulous and difficult to understand. So, um, in the in the beginning, uh, the core concept is that God was one figure or one entity. And again, I also want to stress this because everyone takes the same thing I mentioned with like the afterlife and parables mm-hmm. and all that stuff. Eternity is greater, and existence is much more than our form is capable of understanding and finite. So when I mention like one becomes two and two becomes three and stuff, it's like the people always say like, oh, well, God is like an egg because you have the shell and the yolk and the white, which like that is a pretty good example of how much we have to dumb this stuff down in order to try to process God is what's an going egg. on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you never get that lesson? No. Like in Sunday school growing up? Everyone, like in every Sunday school, like, well, an egg is a shell, it's a yolk, and it's the egg white. They're all different things, but they all make up the egg. It is all one egg. So that's the way it was always explained to me. <laughs> and while that's not accurate, it is accurate of how, again, how much we have to dumb stuff down like try to comprehend god and creation and eternity and everything but to that degree um so god existed as one entity um the way that it worked is sin which i think we talked about this in the last episode but i am of the belief as are many others that sin is almost a physical presence Mm -hmm. it is a thing that comes on to people at least in the spiritual sense and the reason that they had to perform animal sacrifices in the old testament is because they had to put that sin onto something else and then mm-hmm. kill it uh, i believe um jewish still do that correct i uh, i don't the traditional hasidic jews still because they don't believe that there was a turnover into the age of faith so they still follow the old law so my understanding of it is that um i think yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to say too much about modern Jewish practices because I don't totally understand them as much as I do um, pre-Christian Jewish practices. But I, my understanding of the reason they don't do sacrifices anymore is that sacrifices had to be done in either the temple or prior to that, the tabernacle. Um, and since they no longer the have those, bond. they can yeah. no longer do those sacrifices. Um, and in order to rebuild the temple you would have to knock down a rather uh, important Islamic structure, which would probably turn... Cause the, a lot of problems, yeah. Yeah, that, that would turn the yeah. Middle East into the second theater of World War III, so... Um, <laughs> that That's that's the Houdini of this. We think Russia's invading Ukraine, but actually... Okay, no. I'm, <laughs> I'm freaking in trouble. Okay. Um, oh my god. But but yeah, so anyway, that's the basic idea that in the Old Testament, whenever sin first came to the world, we were under the age of law. People had to physically take an animal, pray to put their sins on it, then kill the animal mm-hmm. to get the sin out of here. And then by doing evil tasks, they brought the sin back and so on and so forth. That's how humanity worked forever. Mm-hmm. This is obviously not sustainable, no. uh, not only for like, is it hard to keep up with as a person, but as humanity expands and goes across the globe... Um, what what everyone's gonna have their own altar set up to sacrifice animals it didn't work out so god knew that this was not sustainable for humanity so there was one final sacrifice 
that was sent to earth. So God became two at that point mm -hmm. and sent his son, as it's referred to in the Bible, to become man, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came to earth. And it says all of the sins of the entire world, everyone that, and this also goes back to my theory, that time is a construct built for us by God. Mm -hmm. But we won't touch all of that right now. <laughs> but, in, but in that moment on the cross, all sins from all of past humanity and all future humanity were put on Jesus at once. And when he died on the cross, that was the final sacrifice, again, mm -hmm. according to Christian theology. Yes. So whenever he died on the cross, that means we don't have to do the law anymore. So the new way is through the Holy Spirit. So then Jesus returns to the Father. Uh, he goes back to heaven. But does and, not become uh, one with him again. Not become one, correct. Still, still like a separate. It talks about in Revelations. He sits at the right hand mm -hmm. of God. They are together, but they are not a unified being again. Um, so then, God, um, new way it's done is that we're all born with sin. It's still the first sin of Adam. Now, rather than performing a sacrifice, we just have to ask, and that's what salvation is. Mm -hmm. It's praying for God to come into your heart and save your soul. Mm -hmm. And whenever you do that, according to the Bible, the third part of God that was separated, well, the second part that was separated, so it's God, Jesus, and now something known as the Holy Spirit, which is essentially the essence of God itself, comes and dwells inside of you, and you, well, again, depending on yeah. the type of Christianity, according to my type of Christianity, you're, that's it. it. There's nothing that can knock God out of you. Uh, there's some beliefs that say you can lose it, and then you have to uh, essentially reapply it or take it back in. Uh, but the Holy Spirit was made as part of God as the substitute for the age of law and sacrifice that existed beforehand. Yes. So essentially, you have God... Son Jesus died to get rid of the sins. The Holy Spirit takes the place of those sins now. Yes. That, great, great explanation of that. I could not have done that. <laughs> that I would not have been able to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so we're getting a, we're getting a couple of things in the chat that I think bring us back to the the main topic of the show, which is good. Um, there's a couple of them. Uh, one of them is I thought the Trinity was already present in the Old Testament. No, that's from uh, 24K Zeus. Um, in Christian theology, yes. Uh, when God says things like we, um, he is referring to that the Christian, uh, scholars and, uh, church fathers from the early church period would say that those were, th that was God speaking to the other aspects. Um, I don't know how I feel about that. I think, uh, in my opinion, it's him speaking to the angels. Uh, you know, the, the, the term Elohim essentially means the high ones, um, so it could be him speaking to the Trinity. It could be him speaking to the other angels. Um, a lot of people suggest that this is him speaking to other deities, uh, but that flies completely in the face of the, the Jewish and Christian traditions. So, um, I, I disagree with that, but I, uh, you know, no. So yeah, it's, it really depends on what sect of Christianity you follow for that specific thing. Um, but the importance of the Holy Spirit and Christ does not really come front and center until you get to the New Testament, until you get to uh, the age of uh, faith and grace uh, rather than the age of law. So that's kind of, you know, how that how that goes. It's very you're, you're going to get a different answer to that question from pretty much any sect of Christianity, um, especially when you go between Protestant and uh, Catholic or Orthodox. They have yeah. very, very different opinions on that. Um, and then the other one was, when you die, will you be dead until Judgment Day? And that brings us roundly back to hell, which I think is perfect. Um, listen, I've been trying to get back to hell this entire show. Uh, but, yeah, so I think uh, the, the, rep the representations of hell, first of all, in modern media, I think are fascinating to, to look at. Um, especially when you look at, um, for example, shows like Supernatural that deals with hell quite a I bit. I love that you always bring it back to Supernatural. Oh, yeah, you've you got find it. a way. It's, Every, well, I guess it is kind of like in, the, yeah, we're talking like about the, hell. I guess it, it's an easy through line, but you do it on purpose. <laughs> I think it's the best modern interpretation of um, Christian eschatology. It's not particularly accurate, 
but it's they tried at least you, you like know? the show that's i do i do like the show but in one case you know it's just it's shown as uh people are being have like meat hooks through their flesh and they're being suspended uh, in eternal torment um very dante of very them. hellraiser uh, yeah. very very dante very hellraiser uh very what was that what was the one they go into space deep horizon uh, yeah where they go into space and find hell, all of that, yeah. The Warhammer, I think is what you might yeah, be thinking Warhammer, there. Yeah, yeah, Warhammer 40k. <laughs> where they're like, hell is actually a warp portal where we can, you know, travel through space, but you've got to deal with demons the whole time. You've um, got to fight hell. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, but, uh, so there's a lot of interesting depictions of hell. Um, but the one thing that kind of, I, I think is interesting about it is this concept of time. And like you said, you feel like, Time was a construct that God created for us to help us understand the world around us. But um, when it comes to death, what happens? Do we still maintain that earthly understanding of time? Are people dying and then being conscious but in limbo for however long it takes to get to Judgment Day? I'm seeing it kind of... And in, to be clear, in, in Jewish theology... I. Uh, when you die, the you can get sent to um, Gehenna, so to speak, uh, but it's for a limited period of time. I've seen it even. I, I've seen things that are it's abstract, and you know the amount of time can depend. And then I've seen people, rabbis, say that it's specifically no longer than eleven months, which I think is kind of funny. Um, <laughs> it's just, Why eleven months? It's so Why? arbitrary, isn't it? Yeah, do they have like a? I'm sure they have a reason for that. Yeah, is that like a? Is there a big reason for that, or is it they found a verse and they liked it? Yeah, I'm like the, the Bible. All the time. Who, who decided 11 months? But pretty funny. Yeah, so that'd be, fun, that'd be funny to imagine God being like they, they'll go to time out just mm -hmm. for 11 months. <laughs> like okay. Yeah, so like it's it's a very odd moment of specificity compared to how nebulous the rest of the bible can be at times um yeah. but the jewish concept of the afterlife is uh a, a lot more nebulous and I, I remember sitting through my theology courses in college and asking that question that it's they've got shoal but shoal is more of a an empty void a pit uh of you know nothingness it's not really described as being unpleasant or pleasant it's just restful uh, so it seems like the idea of like Gehenna in the Old Testament when it's used symbolically is that it is a place of um, fire and but that's for the, the purpose of purification, essentially, uh, not necessarily torment, but the, the purification of sin. But in Christianity, when you die, if you die in Christ, then you don't die with sin. Um, so the only way to get into that space would be to die not accepting christ which would be uh pagans atheists agnostics idolaters so on and so forth and the question then becomes is is what the bible is saying is what christ is he saying you will eternally find torment in the term used is of course gehenna or is he saying there will be a period in which you go through this purification this punishment before you are eventually brought back to God, or at the very least on Judgment Day, given the opportunity to reconcile. Um, and I think that that is the kind of the central question when it comes to hell, is what exactly are we dealing with? Where did this idea of, uh, you know, a, a fiery pit ruled over by Satan come from? And what makes the most sense when you try and reconcile New Testament with Old um, so, I mean, I, I'm curious when you were growing up, what was the, the version of hell that you were taught? I, I'm from Southern Appalachia. So it was the stereotypical brimstone and fire, mm -hmm. um, gnashing and wailing of teeth. Uh, get, get right with God. Yeah. Very, uh, who is it? Sinners in the hand of an angry God. Whose sermon was that started like the evangelical thing? It was, uh, Wesley. He was like 17, 1800s. Anyway, mm -hmm. there was this uh, pastor who had this very famous sermon called Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God. Um, in like around colonial times, the United States, and that shaped a lot of the ideas and aspects of sort of the penitent sinner that mm -hmm. Christians exist as, that um, 
still kind of has roots in a lot of Appalachian culture. Not so much now. Um, most, like, I was raised in a very, um, like, all the churches I went to were very positive and happy mm-hmm. and uplifting, good for me. Um, very positive experiences, but the description of stuff like hell was always the literal connotation of, like, you know, the fiery pit and things mm-hmm. like that. And I do think there is merit to that idea because of how it's mentioned in the Bible and talked about. But like I said, it is with the asterisk of humans trying to be explained infinite existence outside of a finite form yeah um so i i I, pretty much like my script my opinion on it is that yeah uh if it's not exact it's the closest definition we got so to speak whatever eternity apart from creation is so all right uh a couple of people did say it's john edwards is they think that's who you're thinking of okay um, Sounds uh, right. I, I've I've studied and listened to so many old uh, evangelists and whatnot, but yeah. Ah, uh, somebody did it. I knew someone was gonna do it. They brought up Revelation. Do. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> hang on, hang on. Yeah, I'm whipping out the interlinear again, so we can read exactly what the the Greek was. Um, and like like I said, we'll get to Revelation, but that's gonna be something that's gonna take so much time, um, that it's gonna be really difficult to to kind of go through but uh yes people often ask me to make a video on um uh revelation i'm just like no well also (laughs) i'm I'm, I'm good (laughs) there's a very important thing to understand also about being a a christian especially a christian who is doing anything along the lines of proselytizing which is that uh revelation 22 19 says and if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy God will take away his part from the book of life and out of the holy city and all the things that have been written in this book. It is extraordinarily dangerous to Mm -hmm. uh, interpret from a point of authority the book of Revelation. Because if you do so and you get it wrong, uh, I I read this and what I'm... My takeaway is that what John is saying, John of Patmos, what he's saying uh, is, you know if you deliberately do it, but I don't want to take the risk that he even means if you accidentally do it. So I'm not going to stand here and interpret revelation for anyone. I'll tell you what it says and I'll, I'll connect it back to other parts of the Bible. I think above all else, the thing a lot of people skip over is that God is a God of mercy. I mean, the very Mm -hmm. existence of the cross and Calvary is evidence of that. Yeah. The fact that we're here in spite of everything else. Um, That being said, I think with cases like that uh, it is in reference to manipulating the scriptures mm-hmm. like specifically when it comes to like taking and morphing into your own form because at the same time he also taught about speaking and teaching about the words that he had written and the words in there i don't think there's anything wrong with that no but uh well I, I well i'm not necessarily in fear of losing out on eternal riches because i said something wrong about revelations yeah at the same time, I don't want to come up as someone who supposedly knows more than someone else and be like, oh, yeah, this book means uh, – and then just give my interpretation of yeah. it. Yeah, so. I, th- I think it's – there's definitely, I, I think, room for suggestion and opinion. I think it's it's just you've got to be careful about how exactly you describe it. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, and, and the, the amount of uh, weight you put behind your words, so to speak. Um, I think yeah. that discussing it is fine. I just, I would be very cautious about, you know, I, I very much wonder about the people who get up there and uh, under the guise of being, you know, Christians talk about how we're in the end times for this reason and that reason. And um, I don't think any of them necessarily are meaning to uh, distort things or to mislead people. I think that they're just foolish, but I do, I do worry about those people, and I hope that the, I hope God is as merciful as I would like I, to believe He is. I think with a lot of those cases, because I know what you're talking about uh, with that. I think with a lot of those cases, it is in good faith, and God understands that because He told the disciples that He will be returning and to be ready for it. And throughout the New Testament, we hear um, 
exhort each other so much the more as ye see the day approaching for which God is to return with the saints and the angels and all that. So it is like it was throughout, you know, the disciples and everything, a common occurrence. Because remember, the disciples thought he, when he, when Jesus said, I'm coming back, that meant like a week from now. Yeah. They're like, oh, he's going to be back soon. We got to hurry. Um, and then near the, which again, Paul is the goat. Paul talked about how maybe not in our lifetime, but always teaching the brethren to be ready for the hour that cometh. And he talks about the race, uh, like we're living in the race before Christ comes. And he was like, on the last lap, this is obviously, you know, like, um, shortening down and paraphrasing what he said. Right. But whenever you're on the last lap of a race, that's when you want to run the hardest. That's when you give it all you've got. And he says, we're in the last lap before Christ. So I think some of those pastors who are like, oh, we're, um, Jesus is coming soon. We got to be ready. That is carrying on the mindset that yeah. a lot of the disciples have. Of now, course. however, whenever they use it as a point of fear and contention in a much more cult setting in order to say, oh, it's doomsday and you have to listen to what I have to say, I feel like that's the same with misinterpreting revelations on purpose. It's manipulating the word in order to justify your own greed and selfishness. Right. I also think about, I can't remember if it's in Revelations during the mention of the great white throne of judgment or if it's somewhere in the New Testament. But there is the part where it talks about people who die and stand before God mm -hmm. and say, did I not prophesy in your name? Right. And Jesus says, depart from me, thy wicked servant. I never knew you. <laughs> and to me, that's it, which... Whew, Jesus, you Jesus at, about drops time. some bars. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Christ drops um, some bars in the Bible. <laughs> my interpretation... That's your next quote. Tolkien <laughs> didn't like Jesus, and uh, Jesus dropped bars. Um, my interpretation with that has always been, and again, my opinion of salvation is that once under faith, always under faith. Right. Um, you don't lose it. But um, whenever Jesus says that to these people who are supposedly mis, because it says that they'll say, "Did I not prophesy in your name? Did I not use the words?" When mm -hmm. he says, "I never knew you," that's not saying I forgot about your you in a way. It's you were never even where you were supposed to be. Yeah. You always had the wrong intentions. You never truly accepted Christ into your heart. Exactly. Um, I think when, like what you mentioned at the end of Revelations and cases of like doomsday preachers and stuff fit into that. Mm -hmm. At least the ones who do it nefariously. I agree with you. Um, and I think I just, before we get to, obviously we're coming close to the uh, the, the Q&A section, which uh, to give everybody an idea of how that works, um, when we get to the, the last half hour of the show, which would be around eight, um, we will actually pay more attention to chat. Um, I've been looking at it, but that's when <laughs> that's when we'll kind of look at it and take questions, and um, we'll we'll read super chats first, and then anything that's not a super chat, we'll get to uh, as as we can. Um, but the the pledge I make is that we will answer all super chats and as many non super chats as possible, um, just because you know the the show the show has to fund itself <laughs> but if there's absolutely no pressure on that end if you don't we will try and get to your stuff but i do want to get to uh, a couple of specific just because we're talking about specifically the i never knew you idea um in matthew 23 33 um we get i'll just read uh you know from 29 Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the tombs of the righteous. And you say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. So you witness to yourselves that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. And you fill up your measure, you fill up the measure of your fathers, serpents, offspring of vipers. How shall you escape the judgment of hell? Um, the word used in the Greek is how will you escape the judgment of Gehenna, um, which, as we said, Gehenna, fiery pit, um, not a good place. You don't want to go there. Also referenced uh, as as the valley of the shadow of death that David walks into. That famous quote: uh, "As I as I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are by my side." Um, you know that that is about. It seems, uh, given how we know he went through the the south or west gate of uh, Jerusalem, um, and headed southwest uh it would make sense that that was in fact the valley of Gehenna so that is the word that is used 11 of the 12 times that hell is discussed uh I could not find a single example where the word hell was itself a lake of fire it was Gehenna which is a fiery dumpster pit outside of Jerusalem 
but uh, in that specific uh, in that specific part of Matthew, who's who's he talking to? In that section, which part of Matthew are you? Matthew twenty three. Also, Matthew, hold on. <laughs> Was this rhetorical, or am I supposed to go look? Because I'm here right now. He's talking to the Pharisees. Yeah. I just I, I was I was offering the the floor to you if you wanted to explain what happened in that bit. Oh oh oh! I see what you're saying. You're talking. <laughs> you're talk, I, I, that was a toss up. I got yeah. it. Uh, so the Pharisees were. That's essentially what you mean, right? Like, what were the Pharisees? Yeah. Who? What were the Pharisees? Why was he admonishing them? So the Pharisees were the religious leaders of the day whenever Christ came. So it had been prophesied forever, well, yeah, literally forever since Adam and Eve left the garden. That's pretty much forever. It had been prophesied since the beginning of time that um, one day someone will come. It will be the Son of God. It will be the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Everything Isaiah said about um, being Yahweh will ascend to earth and he will take on the sins of man, blah, blah, blah. Um, so that was known. All the Pharisees, all the religious leaders know there is going to be someone who comes who is the son of God. And whenever he dies, it will take away the sins of the world, as the Bible says. So whenever Jesus comes to them and he fulfills all the prophecies, he knows all the scriptures and, uh, he fits all the descriptions for what, um, uh, it would say down to the town he was born in the time he was born in the star over him, all of that. He fulfills all the prophecies, but the Pharisees didn't like it. They said, no, uh, we don't accept the idea that you are the son of God. Um, so they constantly all the time tried to pick on him about everything uh, to the point. They eventually killed him. They are the ones who put together the plan with the Roman government to have him crucified. Mm -hmm. They despised him in every sense of the word. So any time that Jesus ever gave a lesson about anything, they were there to ask dumb questions. There was one where he was talking about giving to the poor, and they're like, oh, okay, so um, you said that after death you're reunited with those you were married to in life. What if a man's got, like, four wives, huh? What if he has four wives? How huh? is he going to be with all four of them for every eternity? Huh? What's that mean, big man? And they did that stuff to him <laughs> nonstop. So especially as you go further through, they quit asking questions and just start essentially like making fun of him or picking at him. Right. Like, um, it talked about like, he can't be a King. He's poor. Everyone laugh at the poor man. Ha ha. And that's all that they got to. Right. So at this point in Matthew 23, um, anytime Jesus is responding to them, it is not with anger, at least not all the time, uh, or like hatred in any regard. It is very direct <laughs> mm -hmm. and like that what it takes to get through to these people um so here whenever he says that he's speaking to the pharisees who have right done, and eventually kill him for it and continue to like admonish him so yeah yeah so i i just think that's it, it, it's such a fascinating thing to you know you get through and of course growing up jesus is always a very kind loving figure and it's funny to see like that occasionally there are these outbursts of righteous anger um mm -hmm. that are just like you kind of get where he's coming from, though. Um, well, I mean, it, it was talked throughout about there's a time for war and a time for peace. There's a time for love and a time for uh, hate. Like, uh, it talks about, like, the different factors. The, whew, that terrified me, Sorry. that dog. Give me one word. second. I'll be right uh, back. No, you're good. Continue to explain uh, to the people, though. Yeah, yeah. So, like, whenever it talks about, like, David in the Bible, right? David was a man after God's own heart. He followed, like, um, God to the T. He was God's most favored, at least at the time, among men. Uh, and David was a warrior. He fought against the enemies. Uh, and I were actually talking before the show started about how people in my Sunday school class were asking me about how does God in the Old Testament, how is he so violent and vicious, it seems, like kill these people, knock them out. But then in the New Testament, he's all loving and Jesus. And the truth is, he was consistent throughout the entire time. Because those people that he was just supposed to wipe out in the Old Testament, like the Canaanites, Aiden and I were talking about how it was customary for them to sacrifice their children and put smiling masks on their face and throw them into a fire pit. So whenever God says, those guys who are trying to take over your land, wipe them out, like get rid of them. That's because yeah. they were 
and I talked about the serpents earlier, how the Pharaoh's magicians had serpents. These were guys who were dealing with demons uh, in order to get, like, black magic powers and were sacrificing babies. And Jesus and God was like, yeah, they don't need to be here. They've had their chance. Take them out. Um, so, while not as violent, it is still on character for God, whenever being questioned by the Pharisees, to come here and say, uh, no, you're wrong get out of here. The famous example of Jesus getting angry is whenever he goes to the temple and they're using it to sell stuff. They're using it as a place of money and he runs them off with a whip. Mm -hmm. That is the same God who told David to kill the child murderers. So. Exactly. Um, and, and to be clear, it is not just the Bible that recounts uh, the Canaanites performing these sacrifices uh, of, of children um, on, on the altar. The, the sacrifice, it, the modern scholarship does suggest that the term Moloch, which we have believed for a long time, was the name of a deity, that Moloch was probably the act of giving up your child to the funeral pyre in the fashion of the Canaanites as they did. Um, this is also documented by the Romans and the Greeks. So this this is the way that Canaanites practiced their religion, and of course this was not popular with the Jews um, for some pretty obvious reasons, and the Jewish God was disgusted by it. So... Um, I just, I, I wanted to bring up that specific part, by the way, of Matthew, because I, I don't look at that and see the son of God coming to some of the most high ranking Jews al alive and saying, you're all going to hell. What I see is him coming to them and explaining in terms they would understand through, because Gehenna was a place they would be very well acquainted with historically. I see that as him coming to them and saying, like, how how can you stand before me in this way? How can how can you reconcile your actions with you know with what what the word says, with what my father has said, um, and that what he's threatening them with is not eternal punishment, but instead something they would be very very well acquainted with, which is the concept of Gehenna as a place of righteous purification. Um, so I just think that that's, that's why I wanted to bring that up as the last point, to kind of tie everything together, that hell, Gehenna, um, this concept of the afterlife is not nearly as black and white as it is often thought to be, as it is often explained to people. Uh, growing up, um, I was raised in a weird set of traditions, but primarily Baptist, where what I was taught was uh, there are two afterlives. You can go to heaven or you can go to hell. You want to go to heaven because it's paradise. You don't want to go to hell because it's a lake of fire. It does not seem nearly that binary to me, uh, in in Christ's own words, and the just to be clear, the the twelfth time it's used is the the word that is translated to hell is actually Tartarus, which for those of you who know your Greek mythology, uh, read your Percy Jackson, um, you know that's that's just a bottomless pit for all of eternity. Uh, still not a great way to go, but also not a lake of fire. Um, but I do think that that gets us to about the time where we should start taking questions. From well, I, I, I do want to say okay. real quick, because uh, I did get some research done, believe it or not, for this I one, you. where my <laughs> where my uh, main focus was places where hell is not specifically said in name, but alluded to. Mm -hmm. It kind of backs up the idea of it being like a not good place, um, but the descriptions of it being a little out there. So for an example of it, there's something that is mentioned in Matthew a lot that we're going to see. Mm -hmm. In uh, Matthew 8, verse 12, this is him talking um, to the disciples, and it says, uh, I'll start at verse 11, it says, And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. The children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That is, again, a not good way to be described as ending with the gnashing of teeth. Yeah. And I wonder, this is probably outside the scope for this podcast, but I wonder what the original translations for, like, gnashing of teeth were. Because it keeps coming what, up. What's the exact uh, passage that you're looking at? Uh, so this one's in Matthew 8, 12. Um, the talking, other time that... <laughs> Other time it's mentioned is in Matthew 13 and verse 42. Again, this time he's talking to, um, uh, he's giving a sermon to a multitude. And it says, uh, The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity. 
shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. There's gnashing of teeth, Smith, and again. If you go a little bit down to verse 50, it says, uh, so, well, verse 49, right before it says, So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Gnashing of teeth keeps on coming up, which is why I was curious about that, what the original would be. Go ahead. That is the, the original translation. There will be weeping and gnashing of the teeth. Um, that's that's that pretty is on the mother, then. That, that is the direct Greek to English. Um, the the uh, literal Greek to English. Chapter 25, verse 30. Cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And that that's the interesting thing that keeps coming back, is I keep hearing um, these these two separate things. There is the, the Gehenna of fire, which is the actual Greek to English, is... It's not the lake of fire. It's not the valley. It's the Gehenna of fire, um, or just Gehenna. And then there's the outer darkness with the weeping and gnashing of teeth. So I, I do also wonder if these are two separate things you can experience. Mm. Um, you know, if, if it, perhaps it is that you go through a period where you are in fiery torment to be purified, and then if you still renounce God. If you still reject him, then you go into the outer darkness. Um, I also think that in Revelation, there's a very interesting point at which it says that uh, the idolaters and the murderers and the, the worst of the worst people will be, uh, you know, they'll be sent into the lake of fire where they're going to perish with Satan as, and his angels. Um, mm. So I think that, you know, I, I do wonder if what we're looking at here is it's maybe over the many, many years, this has been dumbed down so much into a binary when it was never supposed to be. That is interesting. Uh, do you think that may be potentially where some of the ideas of purgatory come from? I do think that may be where some of the ideas of purgatory interesting. come from. What, so, all right, so this is like, this is the most popular depiction of hell from the Bible, and it's the parable of Lazarus mm -hmm. and the rich man. You know what word is, because the verse, as it's read in Luke, says... Um, it's Luke what? Uh, it's Luke 16, 23. The English, so I'll read it for everyone. So the, this is a story Jesus is telling. It gives a lot of parables throughout the Bible. Parables are stories that have a spiritual meaning. They were fiction. I mean, they're just like made up stories. He's like, there was a rich man and a poor man. And they're, blah, they're blah, like blah. fables, always but with people different. instead of They're animals. like fables. Yeah, He exactly. said it was what, 16 what? 23. 16, 23. Okay. Uh, and this is it in normal English. It says, uh, so at the end of the story, the rich man dies. And the whole parable is that he had all the riches of the world didn't um, trust in God. So it says, and in hell, he lift up his eyes being in torments and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, father Abraham have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tongue, the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. Mm -hmm. Goes back to eternal torment and fire and right. all of that. Which again, uh, I I like my interpretation of the Bible is I take it literally to be safe a lot of the mm -hmm. time. Uh, and if this isn't like the perfect one to one translation, it is the closest one to whatever exists outside of humanity, mm -hmm. at least in my opinion. And again, as I mentioned in the last one, I don't think God flicks sinners in there willy nilly. Mm -hmm. This is the choice people make to be separate right. from perfection and all that. Yeah. Yeah. Which which is why I've, I'm curious, like if that's why I'm thinking that it makes more sense for there to be several of these, several options, several opportunities even to repent rather than choosing to, rather than just when you die, you're, you're, you're damned. I, uh, you know, I think that it, it, the, the God, the God that I understand from this book is not one who would willfully throw someone away for making mistakes in life. Um, the only time it talks about casting or throwing people into the flame is it talks about the wicked and the evil that the angels uh, take them and cast them out. And again, 
We are talking about something as infinite as angels doing a physical action of picking someone up and carrying them. I think there's a lot more implications when it comes to divinity and if this is like physical interactions or not, or if it's spiritual battles or what have you. Again, I think what Jesus said is the best way to possibly say it, to do it in a means that we can process. Yes, I agree. To give you the exact direct translation here um, in the Greek, what you get is, uh, let's see, uh, and also the rich one and was buried and in Hades. Hades is the Greek word. Interesting. Which, Ooh, boy. How uh, often does that show up in the Bible? Yeah, it, uh, surprisingly often. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. It, okay, in specifically, didn't know that. specifically in the Greek uh the the new testament so that that's interesting and it's important to realize hades uh is the name of a god um the the god of the underworld but it also in um the the later period uh, under rome and in koine greek could be a term that could just simply mean the realm of hades the the greek afterlife um which as we know is is similar uh in, in that it's there's the the fields of Elysium and there's uh, the um, there's Tartarus and there's different different spaces within the underworld of Greek of, of the Greek. So I wonder how deliberate that is, but that's a lot to get into. Um, Interesting. Yeah, and in Hades, lifting up the eyes of him being in torments, he sees Abraham from afar and Lazarus in the bosoms of him. And oh, this is hard to read. Um, and he calling <laughs> said, Father Abraham, pity me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of the finger of him of water and may cool the tongue of me because I am suffering in flame. But Abraham, child, remember that fully received you things of good of fully received you things good of you in the life of you and Lazarus likewise the bad. Uh, now, but here he is comforted, exactly. you but are suffering, and besides all these things between us and you, a chasm great has been fixed, so that those desiring to pass from here to you are able, not those from there to us may cross over. So, essentially saying that La Lazarus can go in, but he can't come out. Um, yes, pretty much, yeah. Yeah, but what uh, I'm the, noticing the, here is the there's, more... there's nothing about eternal torment in that passage right uh i hold on the beggar died lift up his eyes and said some remember thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and likewise lazarus evil things but now he is comforted and thou art tormented and besides all this between us and you there is a great gulf fixed so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot neither can they pass to us and would come from thence and he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house for my five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest thou also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Mm-hmm. That's good stuff. Uh, <laughs> Some good shit. That, 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 that Jesus guy sure didn't know what he was talking about, huh? Yeah. Um, it, not in that story with the mention of Hades. I mm -hmm. do know in other places it mentions the eternal torment. Yeah, but uh, like in Revelation where it talks about eternal torment, it's not about... That's what I mean. Is It, it seems to not be about necessarily belief believer versus non-believer it's people who are genuinely evil that get cast those who are cast forward yeah. and everything um and obviously we could spend another you know six hours talking about this but i do want to take questions so that we can uh we can we can put some some people's worries to rest perhaps um we've got a couple of super chats that i'll read first um so uh from jelly knife we have uh for twenty dollars thank you jelly knife uh, found both of you guys on TikTok. Now it's hard going to sleep without a vid to listen to. Well, thankfully for you, we have many, many <laughs> videos. Um, <laughs> surprised I found you on TikTok. Thank You're you barely much. ever on there. Um, it's probably you. Have you dressed up as a maid yet? Yeah. Making sure. That's Hopefully that's how. 
so, found out about did. me. <laughs> did you did you credit me as being the reason that happened? Were you the reason that happened? I don't remember. I I don't. I don't remember. During the a live stream on the lore lodge that I wasn't in, you made it. I was watching it. And oh you made a no, joke that like, yeah, no, no, no. I haven't worn that maid outfit yet, but I have to. <laughs> yeah, I, I've already made. I, yeah, I've already worn one maid outfit. Apparently, I've got to do it again right, now. Cool, cool. Ugh, Perfect, yeah. You guys are killing me. Um, As a joke for everyone that doesn't know, he was like, "Yeah, I mean, if someone gave like two hundred dollars, I'd wear a maid outfit." <laughs> then so. Isaiah just casually did it evil um worth it from uh son of liberty for five dollars thank you uh he says loving the talk aiden and isaiah i believe that revelation twenty two nineteen is in reference to the false teachers jesus warns of in matthew 24 21 through 28 thoughts if i remember correctly i'm gonna check myself uh, yeah careful. that's what we talked about yeah. um the threat about casting out those who are um essentially take the word as wrong that's what we were talking about with a lot of doomsday cultists and stuff like that um but yes i do agree that whenever it talks about condemnation to those who misuse the word it's yeah. the same ones jesus was talking about with people who deliberately misintend the word of god in order to serve their own purposes and as he said never knew god in the first place so yeah i agree with that and to just for Gotta those who, for those who don't have the passage memorized like me um, for there will be great affliction such as has not happened from the beginning of the world until now, no, nor ever will be. And except those days were shortened, not any flesh would be saved, but on account of the elect, those days will be shortened. Then if anyone says to you, behold, here is the Christ or here, do not believe for false Christs and false prophets will rise up and they will give great signs and wonders so as to lead others astray, if possible, even the elect. The elect, of course, being those who are saved by faith. Um, let's see. Uh, da, da, da. Behold, I tell you beforehand, then if they say to you, behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. Behold, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe. For as the lightning comes forth from the east and shines as far as the west, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. For wherever the dead body may be, there the eagles will be gathered. Which, frustratingly... Ooh. <laughs> frustratingly like that good. last line has been used a lot recently with the whole ukraine thing because they're like oh well the eagles gathering that's that's yep. the americans and i'm like nope i th i think, I, I think that no. that drives me up a wall that like if you don't know uh, for those who aren't like in biblical circles or whatever anytime something happens in the news that is of the tiniest bit of significance they're like, oh, in Revelations, there's a bear that's mentioned, and uh, there's a flag. Uh, the, the California mm -hmm. flag has a bear on it. So this is it, it, this is it. This is what he meant. California is going to sink into the ocean tomorrow every single time. It's so annoying. We'd get rid of a lot um, of but yeah, they're doing this they did. <laughs> All right, anyway, we're moving on. Anyway, <laughs> back to, back to question level. time. Uh, we are we'll in the Q&A so, section. There, yeah. uh, there's two questions from salty steve that i yes. can answer really sure. quick go for it uh, so salty steve had one question where they said am i named after uh the prophet isaiah from the bible which uh yes i am because my father um uh, before he was saved, he was the first generation christian in our family uh before he was saved he was a very proud man uh had a lot of money and kind of hated uh, religion and like christian christianity in general um and then he heard a sermon from a pastor where he quoted Isaiah 41, not 41, Isaiah 51. Anyway, it's a verse that says, uh, your righteousness are as filthy rags before the Lord. And that was the thing that clicked in his head, like, oh, all the stuff I've built. What is that to God? That doesn't really mean anything. And that was like the start of his uh, turnaround to Christianity. So when I was born, he decided to name me Isaiah after that. Um the other question is Salty Steve said that her neighbor, or that their neighbor, um, had a picture or spray painted on a billboard um, John 316. Um, no, is it, they said it was on the side of a barn. They had John mm -hmm. 316. But they didn't have the verse, and they were curious what the verse is. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the book of John at that moment, there is a man by the name of Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a Pharisee, correct? I think so. Yeah, so he was a Pharisee who actually started to 
like the words that Jesus was saying. So he comes to him at night by himself and asks Jesus all these questions. And a lot of the principles of modern Christianity come from what Jesus told the Pharisee there um, about being born again in salvation. And what he tells Nicodemus in John 3.16 is like the cornerstone of all Christianity itself. Uh, the Fer Nicodemus asks him, then what, okay, if you are the son of God and you're coming to earth, what's the point? Why are you here? And Jesus says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And that one verse, John 3, 16 is like the asterisk or the pinpoint for Christianity and religion itself. Mm -hmm. God sent his son die on the cross and then people who trust in him have everlasting life mm -hmm. uh the next verse after which everyone looks over john three seventeen, is uh for god sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved right. because there's a lot of people who like think of christianity and have kind of this backward interpretation that jesus coming to earth started hell and sin and everything mm -hmm. Uh, which he's emphasizing there. That's not what happened. I came here to save everyone. But right. yeah, so John three sixteen is basically Christianity summarized. So I, I love the way you described um, him coming to, you know, talk to Jesus and kind of liking what he says. And all I could think as you said, it was the, the, I like your funny words, magic man. <laughs> like, <laughs> like that just like, was just blaring in my brain as you Jesus spoke. Gives it's like first century pharisee like knowledge of the infinite and creation and he's i like your funny words magic man it's just like it makes sense it fits oh oh my gosh all right let's scroll back through here there's some more um salty steve said sacrificing children is not very cash money of them no it was not um it most certainly was not <laughs> Yeah, that's the way to say it. Someone said Archie has spoken. Um, he, he certainly did speak. Uh, Aiden, can you make a video about St. Pa Pasios and all of his prophecies that are currently coming true? All right, well, that's going to require some research, but sure. Um, that is uh, that is something I can do. Uh, da, da, da. I'm just scrolling back through some of these. Um, Nordic hell is literally an Arctic tundra while Christian hell resembles the core of the earth. I, I mean, yes, uh, that is, that is true. Nordic hell is interesting. It's, it's very much like the, the same idea of the afterlife is neither pleasant nor unpleasant. It's just there. Um, and of course the, the reason we have the word hell in English is that, that Nordic word hell, um, was brought over and became part of the English language uh, as as a term for afterlife. And that is why when the Bible gets translated in, into English, Gehenna in so many cases gets translated to hell, even though I, I really think that's a mistake. Uh, you know, I, I think that that is assigning way too much interpretation to that phrase when it could very, it, it could be much more literal than they're making it out to be. Um, for for what for what it's worth um let's see we're gonna scroll down see what else um, we've got uh what what were gabriel's seven messages he delivers in the bible that was a question for you uh i don't know all of them off the top of my head let's see there's message to nicodemus uh not nicodemus uh Zach, nicodemus on my head zachariah um the aunt the uncle i mean of jesus mm -hmm. right yeah um message to him there was the message to mary there was daniel's message that he carried through the prince of persia there was uh, if we count gabriel's trumpet and revelation that's one i don't know what the other three are i've probably <laughs> heard of them i just can't think of them off the top of my head but gabriel is a messenger most often used for like the big deal stuff and interestingly, often gets uh, compared to Hermes um, from Greek mythology, which There's just probably some overlap if I had to guess. Yeah, which further reinforces my belief that the gods of many of these other uh, religions are, you know, their understanding of oh, does it, Jewish. Isn't angels. that convenient? Doesn't that work out? I, I, so weird. It's it's all. It, 
it's all one big story being told from different perspectives. Uh, yep. What's your favorite Very archangel? Theory. That is to you. Uh, so I'm, I am like a pretty literal Christian when it comes to like biblical interpretation. So the only true archangel, uh, at least the only one mentioned in the Bible directly is Michael. Mm -hmm. Um, that being said, even if we do count the Catholic ones of like, I think it's Uriah, Uriel, uh, Gabriel, Raphael, I think are the Catholic. Yeah. Even if we count them, Michael's still my favorite. Michael's pretty cool. Um, Michael's pretty cool. Michael straight up is supposed to throw down with Satan at yeah. Judgment Day. That's the coolest thing ever. Not only that, but my favorite... So I've, I've started to get into like the weird like little one-off books because they're really interesting why they were included and all. Jude is the craziest thing ever because it's one chapter and it's the most condensed information where the book of Enoch is referenced and then he talks about a conversation the devil had with Michael. <laughs> and like... Oh my gosh, so whenever you're reading the Old Testament when Moses dies, those that don't know, Moses sinned against God, so he wasn't allowed to enter into the promised land. He died beforehand. But at his death, he went to a mountaintop and was allowed to look down into the promised land. It says God gave him vision to see everything in it. And then he dies up there, and it mentions that God buried the body of Moses up there, right? Well, in the book of Jude... It says that Gabriel, or sorry, Michael, uh, goes there to take the body of Moses to bury it. And whenever he went, uh, Satan was there to try to contest with him. And mm -hmm. he started ridiculing Moses just to try to mess with Michael. He's like, Moses was a murderer. Because when <laughs> Moses was a young man, he killed someone. He's right. like, Moses was a murderer. And you acting at the hand of God are going to bury him. Just some worthless murderer. And Michael essentially tells him that they'll settle this later. Oh <laughs> my word. All right. and at, at the death of Moses, Michael's like, you know me and you have our date set. It's like, we will settle this, like, man, that's the coolest thing ever. Yeah, mm -hmm. Michael's the best. Yeah, the, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm reading through it right now. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, let's see, um. It's, uh, around verse 20, I think, in Jude. There's only one chapter. Yeah. Uh, da, 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 da. I'm going to scroll through and the, the, so yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. Um, but these speak evil of those things, which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts in those things, they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Kor. Uh, I'm not finding the part where he says, uh, let's throw hands later. No, 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 no. That's not, that's not, uh, exact. It talks okay. about in the old, uh, that, that was me heavily paraphrasing. <laughs> um, it, it mentions there, they does not have a railing accusation, but rebuked him essentially mm -hmm. said, stop it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and in the old Testament, it mentions that, uh, the devil accused God, which we later see here is Michael, um, which goes back to the whole thing of like, all parts of the heavenly body existing as God, or at least mentioned right. in the Old Testament as God. Um, that whenever Satan came to him, he accused Moses of being a murderer, and uh, the Michael and uh, God told him to essentially I forget the exact wording, it's like uh, uh to stay himself mm -hmm. or to uh, not meddle with the things of God. But I love the idea of Michael bearing Moses being harassed by the devil, and Michael like, stop. <laughs> know where this story goes <laughs> i rebuke thee <laughs> I, rebu I rebuke thee i'm gonna rebuke you really hard in about eight thousand yeah. years oh, so for now i just normally rebuke you <laughs> i'm gonna make sodom and gomorrah look like a walk in the park <laughs> you know that whole sodom thing that's gonna happen everywhere all at once <laughs> on you <laughs> oh boy um oh, that's so cool i love the bible well I, I hate that people so hyper and I, and I know that there is like damaging aspects of Christ of uh, not not Christianity let me rephrase there's damaging aspects of religion that touts the flag of Christianity uh, that has hurt people and like caused people to kind of develop these weird um, occurrences with it and kind of keep it at arm's length because they've been harmed by it or whatever and I totally understand that but I hate 
that beyond, of course, people's, you know, individual stories mm-hmm. of trauma or whatever they experienced. I also hate it because it keeps people from looking into some of the coolest things ever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like the crazy that's one of the reasons i'm doing this podcast mm-hmm. um but that like some of the coolest ideas like no matter how you think of it as a story as religion as history or what have you i think of it as all three but like you hear stories like that about the right hand man of god bearing his prophet on earth at the time who he was enacting it's like throughout the bible there's one person at a time after jesus it was multiple but through the old testament there's like the prophet and then like uh, the the judges before and like the one at a time chosen to carry out the will of god and to have this one being honored by god in burial because he like not while not perfect followed the will of god to his best and as he's being buried to have the devil fight the angel burying him Mm -hmm. and michael rebuking him oh my word that's the coolest thing ever yeah like i (laughs) what what a flex in the afterlife like the devil tried to stop oh, yeah. my burial like, that's... <laughs> was um, it um I, I forget uh in the garden of gethsemane mm-hmm. was elijah and moses correct or was it abraham i think it's, it's elijah. Moses, right oh, there's oh yeah two. No, i think it it's elijah. i think it's elijah and moses um i can yeah yeah i can check if so you like to, to give you an idea of like how honored moses was Jesus was on earth about to die on the cross the uh, the night before he was arrested, which is already an emotional thing and gets me going anyway. But he was afraid. Uh, it says he prayed to God and said, Father, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from over me, which, uh, my word. But Jesus was afraid. Um, and while he was in the garden, it says an angel was sent to comfort him. And whenever Peter came to see Jesus, he was talking to Elijah and Moses. So Moses had the testimony that when the Son of God was about to die on the cross, he talked to the Son of God to comfort him. I want to talk about, like, man. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm looking for it. Elijah's my favorite prophet, um, just like all the stuff he did. Um, there's this one, like, I, I did a study of Elijah and read through it. And with every character in the Bible, especially the Old Testament, there is like a moment that is very highlighted and pointed out where it's like, and this is where they messed up. Like, this was their big goof. There's what they did wrong. And Elijah wasn't a perfect person. But there was um, one moment where it looked like that's where the story was going because it said Elijah ran away from uh, the mission he was essentially set out to do by God. Mm -hmm. And he went and hid in a cave. It says God came and talked to him in the cave and said, "Why do you hide?" And I, I, I was like, "This is going to be the moment in the story that Elijah was afraid. Like mm-hmm. that's what his sin's going to be. He's like, I'm afraid I can't do it." And Elijah looked at God and said, "How could I, as so humble and pathetic a beggar, speak for the words of the Master?" Mm-hmm. Oh my word! Like, like him, like his, his like moment of cracking faith wasn't. I can't do this. Um, because I'm afraid, because I'm like sinful or whatever, it was I'm not worthy enough to do this. And because of that, God, it says God shakes the mountains, and that's the that's where the still small voice comes in. He shakes the mountains, he causes whirlwinds and hurricanes. And I love the way it's worded because it says there was a hurricane, but God did not speak in the hurricane. Mm-hmm. There were earthquakes, but God did not speak in the earthquakes. He spoke to Elijah through a still small voice. Mm-hmm. It said unto him, Because you are unworthy is the reason you are the one who will carry out this message mm-hmm. um because oh it's so good but, Such uh, good like jesus, yeah, yeah i know right but god doesn't need like god can do the earthquakes he can do the fireballs and the hurricanes and all that he spoke in the still small voice because he needed elijah to be that still small voice and because right. he was humble enough to recognize that is the reason he was the one to carry it on and i love elijah for that but to think that when jesus was in the garden and afraid what was it moses was that I the other one? I couldn't find the exact bit. I'm, I'm going to say I'm, it as a time. I'm, I'm like 90% wrong. sure it's Moses. I'm also 90% sure. But uh, the fact that when Jesus was in the garden, the two ones who were righteous enough to bring him comfort were Moses and Elijah. Mm-hmm. Woo, man. <laughs> yeah, it's, there's some really cool passages. Like even if, even if you don't want to believe it, at least read it because there's some good zingers in there. Like, 
Yeah. Um, I do want to get to a couple more of these. Uh, let's see, we've got... Can I, can I say one more thing sure. about Elijah real quick while I'm thinking about it? So Elijah is also the sarcastic prophet. Um, <laughs> like, every single line, there is a zinger or something that he does. Um, there's a part where he goes to the king. It's been a drought for 30 years, I think. And he goes to the king and so, essentially says something to the effect of, wow... Man, what are you gonna do with all this water everywhere, man? Like, ah, oh, you got so much water, you're gonna do, like mocking the king essentially. Mm -hmm. And then after, um, they have a there's a competition the king holds where he's like, Elijah, you get your god and see if he can perform a miracle, and I'll get my prophets of I think it was Baal. I, I'll get my prophets of Baal, and we'll see if they can do a miracle. And Elijah won the competition. And afterwards, um, keep in mind it has been a drought for thirty years. Mm -hmm. Elijah says, leave and don't let the rain stop you. And as soon as he says it, it starts raining. <laughs> like, oh my word. <laughs> like, I, just, I, I want I want to see these as like really high production quality short films. <laughs> like <laughs> I know, right? That would like, just be so, so cool. sick to watch. Uh, let the rain stop yeah. you. Uh, but okay. but uh, the, one, the one I wanted to say that made me laugh is he had a assistant by the name of Elisha, and that's not his actual name. Elijah meant like God, um, God prophesied, and Elisha something like God carry on prophecy. Mm -hmm. That's why the name sounds similar. So Elijah was walking with Elisha, and Elijah knew that this was about to be the point where he dies, or in the Bible, God takes him on to heaven. He doesn't mm -hmm. have to die. And he asked Elisha, he says, you have been good to me. You have I've been a brother. You've been a servant to me for years. If there were anything I could give you, what would it be? And Elisha says, I ask that a double portion of your spirit be upon me. Like all, all this love you have for God and this charisma and everything you have, I want twice as that. that that's what I want. And Elijah says, thou hast asked a hard thing. <laughs> to me like, hey, you want to be more... More than me? That's kind of hard, man. <laughs> and uh, but but he says, um, "This will God do." And they hug, and then God comes down, and Elijah gets in the chariot and takes him into heaven. Uh, and Elisha, who had never performed a miracle before, uh, he picks up. Whenever Elijah left, he took off his coat and laid it there um, in front of Elisha's feet. So Elisha puts on the coat symbolically, you know continuing on the work of Elijah, he walks back to the river that they had took taken a boat across. And the entire town's watching him. They watch Elijah and Elisha travel into the woods and just Elisha come back wearing Elijah's coat. Elisha takes off his coat, slaps the water, and the water parts. <laughs> and he walks across the water. And everyone's like, oh, oh, no. <laughs> I, I love the Old Testament. That's so it's scary. got some such good stories. We we need more. Uh, we need more Joseph King of Dreams style. Uh, yes, man, that movie's so yeah. good. Um, oh my word. Anyway, but yeah. So uh, all right, we got one. I'm just gonna try and get through these really quick. Uh, we got one from uh, JTK Vid that says, "Is the idea of temporary suffering veering into universalism, or not really? Because it would still allow for people to reject God after periods of suffering, sort of like purgatory, I guess." I, I think so. That's what we were kind of saying is, you know, it could be that this this temporary period of suffering or purification in the Gehenna of fire is, you know, your your opportunity to repent and return to return to the fold. And if you reject that, then you're you're done. <laughs> you're done, though. Yeah. <laughs> bye, bye, bye. Um, <laughs> Uh, from Sammy Olenberg, we get, can you get out of hell? Uh, it doesn't really seem like it, but that's kind of what we've been talking about the whole time is, you know, has, has translating the Bible and the activities of the church over the last 2000 years changed, uh, the, you know, changed our perception of hell away from what it originally was meant to be. Uh, in my opinion, I, I, I'm veering towards more and more the more I study the idea that uh, there are multiple opportunities um, to repent once in life, perhaps once um, in Gehenna and maybe even one more time at Judgment Day. Uh, but, you know, I think once once you are cast into eternity, as that that is the term that is used for where Lucifer is going to go, 
um, after after Judgment Day that he and his angels will be cast into the outer darkness, cast into eternity. Um, I, I think at that point, if you're cast into eternity with Lucifer, there's no coming back from that. And that's just going to be eternal separation or perhaps even destruction. Um, someone did ask uh, what happens to uh, giants upon their death. Now the thing is, if, <laughs> if we're going, if, if uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna really quickly say something uh, because I found it very interesting in the Book of Enoch. Uh, it is said that those spirits which are made on earth will remain on earth, and those spirits which are made in heaven will remain in heaven after death. So, again, Enoch is not considered scripture. Enoch is considered. Uh, it's not even deuterocanonical. It's just considered this. You Christian me, adjacent one. Tell me the giants are ghosts now. I'm Is telling you, you I'm telling you <laughs> that the book of Enoch says that when the no, Nephilim no, die, when the Nephilim die, their evil spirits remain on earth. That is what Enoch says. Do this to me. So yes, I'm already, uh, I'm already weird enough. I can't add this to the when, when the giants die, they become um Every like time demons. I go on a normal podcast or interview, they're like, hey, we're here with Windigoon. So you, you think giants are real, huh? You idiot. Uh, you big stupid idiot. You think giants are real? Meanwhile, I'm here encouraging you. That. <laughs> yeah, meanwhile, Aiden's like, you, yeah, they're ghosts too. Did you know that? You should start telling people that they're, that's where ghosts come from. Just... If I do that, I will never work again in this industry. <laughs> they will not talk to me. If I try to, yeah, no, giants are real. And guess what? Go poltergeist and stuff. Those are giants. Those are giant ghosts. Don't make me weirder. Like, I'm struggling as is. Oh my god, I love it. Uh, someone uh, said, "Will the video on demand be available later?" Yes. Uh, as soon as it finishes processing, this will be available to view. So uh, tonight, even. Um, let's see what else do we have. Somebody said, "Paradiso when?" Uh, hopefully next month. All right. Very succinct. Uh, Misty Moment Channel says Michael is goaded. Uh, I, I would agree. Uh, but is he goaded with the sauce? Um, Nazarite says uh, Solomon had 700 wives. About, yeah. Yeah. Actually, I actually did that in Sunday school uh, last week about Solomon's uh, death. Because the wives, it's a, uh, yeah, keep in mind Solomon, it says he was tempted by his wives to follow their gods. He followed the god of the Canaanites and the god of the, uh, that's where uh, Moloch's mentioned again there too. It says he followed the Moloch of the Canaanites. Yeah, so, which would um, mean the sacrificial practices of the Canaanites in the newer Yeah, so think, the think about scholarship. Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, who talked to God directly and had all these gifts, being tempted to sacrifice kids for false yeah. gods. Yeah. That, really paints Solomon in a different and I gotta say I uh, gonna make this get real weird now as a Freemason that has stunning implications on my <laughs> on my philosophical worldview. Oh, it does, doesn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Idiot. Because um, a lot of <laughs> okay, Love. giant boy. <laughs> stop that! No, you you did this to me. You stop that right now. I'm gonna read it. I'm gonna read it just to spite you. Hold on. Um. Ba 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 ba. At, uh, where, where, hold on. It came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. Ooh, there's another, like, quick zinger. Yeah. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonoans, and after Malcolm, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. Zing. And did Solomon build up a high place for Chim Chimosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon? Mm -hmm. Likewise did he for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. This is for you, the Mason. And the Lord was angry with Solomon <laughs> because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice. That's the Bible being like, you, you saw God twice, and you're still like, uh... I like this killing baby thing better. To be to be commanded... fair, to in my defense, go ahead. The, try the parts about Solomon that we like are not those ones. <laughs> uh. That's what you think. That's then true. I am only I'm only a fourth degree. Out, yeah. 
when you get to fifth degree, they're like, okay, so his wives are actually cool. We like his wives. <laughs> that's that's why there's uh, 33 of them is because, you know, you've got to slowly, like, you got to bury the lead. <laughs> No, yeah, but uh, I no, I do intend. To, I will say I do intend to uh, reach at least thirty second degree. Um, and uh, what happens at thirty third degree? How many of those are there? That's like it's. There's not that many. It's a very. It's really an honorary title. That nothing changed. There's no lesson associated with it. It's just something that's conferred upon you for uh, great service to Freemasonry. Um, I would love to have a conversation with you sometime as friends, just about how that structure yeah. works. Oh, we absolutely can. Um, I, I would love to. We'll we'll talk about it another time. But uh, yeah, no. So that's the thing, though that I that I obviously determined when I became a Mason was like, if this ever does veer into Satanism, Luciferianism, um, or rejection of God and Christ as a Christian, I'm going to walk away from it. Now, I won't be able to uh, say why necessarily, but uh, I, I will say this. If you ever see me walk away from Freemasonry, know that there was a good reason. Um, and Interesting. I, I can, I'll be I, watching your career with great yeah, interest. <laughs> bring Star Wars into this. Um, but yeah, no, if I ever walk away from, from Freemasonry, I will not be saying why, because I took an oath of secrecy and I swore that oath to God. Um, so if that is ever... Hmm. Yeah. So I. Uh, oh, you're 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 talking big based oaths and covenants and everything. Yeah. So I'm liking um, what I'm hearing. Very cool. And and to be clear for anybody who might be like, he's telling us secrets about Freemasons. All of this is published online by Freemasons. Like this is all. I I don't say the things I'm not allowed to say. Um, also, there's like books where you can actually that are published by the Masons that tell you every single step of the rituals. It's, and they're not, you can get them on Amazon. I'm not going to tell you the like names. People but. who just broke the oath or had the authorization of, um, one of the grand lodges. Interesting. Uh, in some cases, for example, I uh, morals and dogma by Albert Pike, um, who was a 33rd degree Mason. I, uh, that entire book was authorized by the Southern jurisdiction of, uh, Scottish Rite Masons in America. So, Morals and Dogma, what a title for a book. Morals and Dogma of Freemasonry. Wow. Yeah, but, all right. Well, that is uh, that is going to take us to the end of the show. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Um, as you all know, Wendigoon can be found as Wendigoon everywhere except, I think, Twitter, right? I'm just Wendigoon8 over there, so yep. still, just, yeah, just type it in. Yeah, and uh, you are currently watching this on the Lore Lodge YouTube channel. If you have not yet, subscribe. You know, we, we like that when you do that. It makes us feel good about ourselves. Uh, number go up, my dopamine go up. So please and thank you. Um, and you can find me at the Aiden Mattis on basically everything. So uh, without further ado, I think that's going to be the end of the show. And we'll be back in a month with another weird Bible topic. Thank you. Great.